so yeah, this is a fairly common setup, uh, setup that we fairly commonly consider. So let, without further ado, let me just set it up. So this is mass on a spring. Um, and do I want a larger mass? I think it's going to be more fun with a larger mass. So let me have a slightly larger mass hanging here. Oh, wow, that is large. Uh, let me see how big the other mass is. Ah, some I they must have different densities. This is lighter. Okay, okay. I think I I can work with this one. So, so this is the kind of setup that we uh, often deal with when we have. So we have now introduced the work and energy, and we now treat springs with the spring potential energy that helps us analyze the dynamics of the thing. Um, so that like if someone says, this spring is pulled down by this much, you let it go. How fast is it moving when it says some different positions? That kind of questions. It's something that we can now address. And as you, um, and as you approach a situation like this, there's one way you can approach it, which might be the default way to do it, might even be the kind of the simplest approach in some sense. But I want you to show you a way in which this analysis can be simplified um, and, and justify that simplification. So let me start out with uh, how some people might address this setup. So you can, in this setup, you can treat um, you can treat the um, you can treat the gravitational and spring potential energy completely separately. That's uh, nothing stops you from doing that. And um, I'm trying to see if I can move this. It doesn't let me move. Um, yeah. Okay. Let me use this movable eye. Um, so one way to do that might be. You have, um, so this is your spring's equilibrium length. And as you hang this mass, you, you see this height reference here. Let's keep this reference here. So you can say when the mass is at this height, there's some gravitational potential energy. In fact, that's what the, the graph on the left is showing that when this is at this height, I pause the simulation, it's showing up the this mass have this much gravitational potential energy. And at this position, it has zero uh, spring potential energy because the spring is at the at its um, equilibrium position, equilibrium length. And as this mass moves downward, its gravitational energy decreases. In fact, it decreases linearly until it's at height zero and then it goes negative. I think all these people have seen before. And another thing you also see is that as this spring stretches, the spring potential energy increases as a, a, the displacement is squared. And you can also push it up and it does the same thing. Um, or it also increases it. spring potential energy. It increases either way to pull. Now, that separated uh, treatment is something you can do. You are not forbidden from doing that by any means. Um, but in some sense, it's, uh, it's more complicated than it needs to be because how much the spring is stre stretched and whatever the height of the mass is, that's going to be uh, two things that are actually tied together. So it's going to be only one thing. And so to be treating them as two separate things, uh, there's some sense of inefficiency there. And the other thing is um, the direction of a change of either the gravitation or spring potential energy alone doesn't really tell you how your total potential energy changes. So it doesn't tell you how your kinetic energy, which is the mechanical energy minus the total potential energy, doesn't tell you how your kinetic energy would be changing. Um, as a um, kind of static example, watch as I slowly pull this down. You see that, the, so here where it says total energy, right now it should be the total potential energy. As I pull this down, you see, oh, my total energy is decreasing as I pull the spring. So you might wonder if that's always going to be that way. And then as you keep pulling, 
it's not. So around here is where your potential energy is at a minimum. Because as I move this, it doesn't really change. Now, as I pull it even farther, it, it, the potential energy is increasing. So there's a, a different stretching of the spring. There are different things that's happening. And you can almost see that here. Let me, um, in slow motion, run the simulation and watch what happens with the kinetic energy. So as this, uh, and actually let me get rid of damping. <laughs> as this falls, you see the kinetic energy increase up to a point. And this up to a point is where your total potential energy is uh, decreasing to a minimum. And uh, past that point is where you see the kinetic energy now start to decrease as the total potential energy increases. And when you look at motion, there is an aspect of this that at least reminds me of a pure spring motion. As in, if somehow I could treat this combined potential energy as one potential energy, then, um, then it would simplify this analysis because instead of tracking these two separate potential energies, it would be nice to be able to say, instead of this was my equilibrium length, it'd be nice to say, my actual spring equilibrium is here. This is my equilibrium length. And when I pull my mass from this position and that increase in potential energy, if I could put all of that into spring potential energy, then I can describe this oscillatory motion much more simply as uh, oscillation of just a spring on a mat or mass on a spring around this equilibrium position. That's what I would like to do. Um, and I think that's the kind of thing that we need to justify. We need to prove that that kind of um, consideration, uh, thinking of the combined gravitational and spring potential energy as one spring that has a slightly different adjusted parameters from original spring. I think that's something that we should be able to prove. So let me do that. Um, this is what I'm going to do. Um, I think I can try to describe my setup of a spring here. So let's see, where should I start? So let me go first so that I can basically write on the side and not use the zoom annotations. So, so I have a mess on the spring. Um, and let me start out with the, uh, the original description because that's the description that I know is valid. I don't have to, um, uh, I don't have to, um, uh, to talk my way out of anything. <laughs> so, um, so you have this, which is, um, I have a mass that is getting uh, displaced by some distance um, delta x. And this parameter is going to connect to, um, to the spring potential energy. But this parameter is also actually connects to um, gravitational potential energy. And in this case, for the sake of simplicity, uh, instead of using this as my height equals zero, let me use this also as my height equals zero. Um, and I am allowed to do that because with the uh, well, with any potential energy, but especially gravitational potential energy, what's meaningful is a difference in potential energy. So you can always change your reference point. Um, so as this mass falls, your uh, gravitational potential energy is going, this uh, MGH is going to become more negative as my H is it's equal to minus delta X. So as my delta X increases downward, um, my gravitational energy will, uh, it will decrease. It's decreasing from zero down into negative uh, values. So all of that is fine. Um, I can just uh, set my height to be zero at the equilibrium length the position of the spring. So we did a description. Uh, let me write out the expression for the 
let me work with the total potential energy because um, I think what I want to be able to say is regardless of where this mass is at, um, there's some way to translate what the description of the potential energy of the system would be um, with the separate consideration of gravity and spring to um, what the combined spring potential energy would be. So um, let me write down the expression for the total potential energy. That's going to be the sum of my gravitational potential energy and the spring potential energy. And I think I can write both of them in terms of this parameter delta x. Let me do that. So mg. And I'm going to make a delta x so that this direction is positive direction because that's where I'm stretching, elongating the spring. Uh, mg times minus delta x plus one half spring constant times delta x squared. And if you're just looking at this, you might think, hmm, that looks nothing like, um, so if I'm somehow trying to say, oh, this is some kind of a new spring force. Well, this has to take some kind of form of uh, one half K delta X squared. It needs to have this term. And what I see here right now, it looks nothing like this. So, okay. Um, now, uh, there is a pure mathematical way to do what I want to do next. I think it's called completing the square. Uh, but since this is not an algebra class, it's a physics class, let me find a more physical justification for what I want to do. So, for a physical justification, um, I think what I'm looking for first is my new equilibrium position. Because uh, one thing that I know definitely changes between my old spring and my new spring is that equilibrium position is not at the same position. Um, the old spring equilibrium position is here. My new spring, the equilibrium position should be right here. So, and that's significant that um, that where the equilibrium length position of the new spring would be at this position. So let me give it a, a special symbol. So I can call this a displacement. Let me call that delta x equilibrium. It's somehow a significant position. And this is the position where I would like the equilibrium position of my new uh, spring force to be. So, okay, um, and I think I can actually even uh, come up with an expression for this, you know, quick Newton's law consideration, draw a free body diagram, at that equilibrium position, there's gravity pulling down on the mass, there's a spring force uh, pulling uh, upward on the mass, and because the acceleration is zero, oh, the spring force, which is equal to, um, the magnitude wise, which is equal to k times delta x equilibrium must be equal to mg. That's how the acceleration would be zero there. So I can actually solve for this. And solving for the equilibrium length, I get mg over k. So this equilibrium length, it has an expression in terms of parameters already in the setup. So it's so okay, I have that. Yeah, so that's the, the new equilibrium position. So, okay, um, let me think around that. So I guess um, before I was saying how I want this to be expressed as some kind of new and improved uh, spring potential energy. And originally I was saying, hey, I want this to be K times delta x squared, but if I think about it more, I don't think I want that because um, where I want my spring potential energy to be zero is not where delta x is equal to zero. Like up here, 
I, that's not where my new spring potential energy would be zero. That's actually at uh, quite a bit of an upward distance from, um, it, it's quite, involves quite a bit of compression from where the new equilibrium length is. So I think for the potential energy of my new spring, I actually want this uh, energy to be minimum, not at where delta x is equal to zero, but at where delta x is equal to delta x equilibrium. And one way to get that is to do a little bit of translation, uh, transformation of function. Um, let me write it down and we can just double check to sure, make sure that it looks right. So the transformation I want to do is this, where I see delta x, I want to replace it with the delta x minus delta x equilibrium. And then the square is still there. And we can check that. So the, the way we would check is we can plug in what we get when we plug in delta x equals delta x equilibrium. Then I have delta x equilibrium minus delta x equilibrium. Zero, zero squared, zero. So zero seems pretty small. So good. <laughs> um, so, so this is what I think I, I can uh, show my new spring potential energy to be. Let's, uh, let's double check that. So what I'm going to do is, uh, this is uh, some parenthesis thing squared. So let me expand this out, compare the expression I get against this um, original total potential energy, and see if there are any adjustments I need to make. So I'm going to expand this out. My new spring potential energy, let me call that yeah, new spring is equal to uh, one half k. And as I do this square, I'm going to have delta x squared. Okay. Um, plus, I'm going to have minus delta x equilibrium squared. So, uh, so when I write it all out, distribute one half k, it's going to be one half k times delta x equilibrium squared. Okay. And I have the cross terms, um, the terms you get from multiplying this with that and this with that. There's two of them and it's a, a minus, so two times one half, so one times k and the cross term, delta x times delta x equilibrium. Hmm. I do see some matching terms and that's encouraging. This one half k delta x squared that matches with that, great, so far so good. And, uh, huh, I think none of these look like those. Well, um, so I have a one term, so remember delta x is a variable, so you have to treat it carefully. And I have here one term with a linear term of delta x. And I do have a linear term of delta x here and they are both have negative sign in front of it. It would be nice if I could somehow show that this term is the same term as this. Uh, and that's where this uh, comes in useful. I can substitute this, I can substitute this in for delta x equilibrium. So let me just do that quickly here, rewriting this, I get k times the delta x times mg over k, K is cancel, I have delta x mg, and that is exactly that with the minus sign there. So great, um, I have uh, these two matching terms, and, and that's all the terms. I have uh, this expression here that didn't match to anything. So initially it might look like I have failed in my task, but I want you to look at this expression carefully. Uh, consider this, is there any variable in this expression. There isn't. <laughs> K is constant. And this delta x equilibrium, that's also constant, which can be expressed in terms of constant. So, so this is as though, um, so my initial guess here, it was close. It was close in terms of the in what form, uh, in terms of delta x it depended, in what terms of the variable it depended, it worked, but I missed out on a little bit of an offset. So there ought to be an offset, 
plus or sorry plus let's see um yeah I'm sorry i'm trying to formulate this correctly um so uh, the the way i would formulate it uh, i want uh, some way to relate this original total potential energy to this uh, new spring potential energy and the way i would say this my new spring potential energy can be expressed in terms of the old uh, total potential energy and then plus some offset there is a constant offset between this expression here and this expression here the constant offset here being one half k delta x equilibrium squared and remember what I said about potential energy earlier. The only thing that's meaningful about potential energy are always the differences. That's what gives change of kinetic energy. That's what results in all the dynamical stuff. So if the only difference between our old representation of potential energy in a system like this, this expression here, this expression here, the only difference between that and this uh, spring-like representation, this one, if the only difference is this constant offset, then, um, then these two expressions for potential energy in terms of the quantity delta x, they are, um, they are functionally equivalent. Any kind of analysis you can do using this you can repeat the exact same analysis using this. The only thing to be careful of is if you calculate this um, absolute potential energy under one representation, you have to be aware that that absolute potential energy might not be quite the same in the other representation unless you make this uh, unless you make this adjustment. So, so this is my proof that when you have a system like this you can treat it like a, a pure spring energy system. And the limitation that you see uh, mentioned in the other video <laughs> where I say, oh, you can't do that in this situation is um, you have to be able to always tie this uh, extension or um, stretching of a spring. You have to always be able to tie that with uh, a gravitational potential energy you have to always be able to say this. And in situations where you can, maybe the mass comes off of the spring, then, then you have to treat them separately and just analyze in that way. Uh, because, you know, when, when the delta x, uh, when the stretching of the spring decouples from the height of the mass, then, then all right, yeah. You, you, this representation depends on those two things always being tied. So, so yeah, that's the proof, um, it, or <laughs> it's something that I am calling proof. I don't know if it's a formal proof. So, and and I, from time to time, I will use this as a shortcut uh, because if I know mass is always going to be attached to the spring, then sometimes it's nice to be able to just treat that as um, spring dynamics without worrying about the, there being a constant gravitational force.